It's time to study the word. So we are looking at Joseph's life as we have been doing over the last several Wednesday nights. And uh, we are so thankful for all of you who come out and thankful for those who are joining us tonight by Facebook Live. Some of them are at home and able to hook into the study of the word. And that's a great privilege. And it doesn't matter who's teaching the word. It's about the word. Amen. Thy word have I hid in my heart, the scripture says. So it's crucially important that all of us understand the need, crucial need in our lives. You need, this is our daily bread. This is the strength of our life. Now I'm not going to read a lot out of the, out of the 45th, chap, 45th chapter that we are looking at. The, the chapter that dealt with um, Joseph and Pharaoh working out the situation where the family is being brought over from Canaan into Egypt. If you remember, God told uh, Isaac not to go into Egypt, but now he's giving direction for Jacob to go there at this time. God always has a plan, and God's timing is important. You know, we just think we can just kind of live haphazardly, but God has timing. And if we'll be sensitive to the voice of God and obedient to the timing of God, he will bring things about in his time and his way. In his time, his way is always better. Someone spoke to me today concerning a work in ministry that they were doing, and they were talking about the timing of God, how that right now things have come together in a certain way that, that God has been dealing with them for a long time. So thank God for his grace, and he'll continue to work. Now, Joseph's family has been moved and taken care of. Uh, Pharaoh, because of Joseph's faithfulness, and, and remember I told you he had a testimony to Pharaoh? that he was a man of God, that he had the spirit of God that were living in him. Even a, a reprobate who did not know anything about God really could recognize God in, jo in Joseph. What an awesome thing that is. We should be more concerned about what the people who don't know Jesus can see Jesus in us. That should be our goal and our aim in life to say, Jesus be Jesus in me so much that wherever I go that people see Jesus because he's the only one Jesus is the only one who can help anybody. You know, you may have a cry of your heart, you wish you could help this one or help that one. I want you to know the bottom line is, the best thing you'll ever do for anybody is to give them Jesus. Just give them Jesus. And then they, they'll be able to work things out. So um, I want you to understand that this uh, chapter is a story of the forgiveness of, of Joseph. Forgiveness is just about the most difficult grace that people who are children of God have to deal with. You know, I don't know about you, but before I understood grace and how it works, I had a hard time forgiving. I'd pray, oh God, I forgive that person. And I'd cry, because you know what, I, believe, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that unforgiveness is a sin. It's a sin. And so, therefore, because it's a sin, and because God requires that I do it, and because I can't do it, God has obligated himself to do it through me. And when we understand that, and we get our attitude right toward our provision, then the work of grace can be done in our life, and supernaturally, surprisingly, all of a sudden, Wow, I can't believe, you know, we can't hardly believe the work that's been done. I don't know about you, but that's true in my life. Like, wow, I look back on a few weeks ago or a few years ago and I go, what happened to you, girl? Those things that used to bother you don't bother you anymore? Those things that used to drive you crazy don't drive you, you know, I don't have to get down and beg God to help me to forgive people anymore. Because I have learned that forgiveness is divine. You know, there's a saying. Forgiveness is something that is divine. Only God can really forgive. Oh, I know there's little things, you know, you forgive people because they stepped on your toe or something, you know. <laughs> little things that are easy. But there are things in life that are impossible to forgive. And let me explain another thing about forgiveness. Just because you have forgiven does not mean you have forgotten. Only God forgets. We're not God. We're still human. And we're going to remember 
you got to remember now, there are a lot of things in my life, can y'all say this is true, that I have actually forgotten. People come and say, do you remember about me? No, I don't. I don't remember that. And, and it's not because they have Alzheimer's. It's because it's not important anymore. And it's become so unimportant on the rung of importance that it's way down there somewhere. And I don't even remember so many of the things that maybe people think I'm still holding against them. I don't forgot about them. And that's the work of grace. So we need to never think that somebody's holding a grudge. We need to just let it go ourselves and let God deal with the other side of the equation. But forgiveness is divine. I want you to understand that. There are things in your life that you still can think about. While I'm talking about this, probably some of you had some issues you're thinking about right now. These things happen. Things like divorce. There's always bitterness in divorce. There's always unforgiveness in divorce. I've never seen an amicable divorce where there wasn't any aggravations and frustrations and angers that went through the process. There's always that. There's always occasions. You know, the people you love the most can hurt you the most. And there's always the occasion. And by the way, let me say this about forgiveness. Even if the person did not do you wrong, but you thought they did you wrong, you still got to forgive. You know, just because they didn't do you wrong doesn't mean you don't have to forgive because if you're holding something in your heart, whether it's true or false, you still got to allow God to do the work in your heart of forgiveness. If you don't forgive, you're going to be in a dangerous position. So therefore, you're going to have to let God do the work. It's God that has to do the work. But I want to tell you, God is faithful. And everything he has ever required you to do, he will enable you to do. Do you understand that? I gave the illustration a long time ago about, you know, if, if you told me to go out and pick up my car, uh, that's what? What would you call that? Impossible. <laughs> I cannot go out there and pick up my car. Maybe a little, but I can't pick it up. And the same thing in, in everything in your life, there are things to you that are impossible. So if you're going to require me to pick up my car, you're going to have to bring a forklift. Come on. Because there are things I can't do. And if you require me to do those things, you're going to have to give me the ability. It's like a, a, a baby. If you said, get over there and drive the car. They can't drive the car. Their legs are not long enough, right? Right. And a lot of times their arms aren't long enough. So if you want them to drive a car, guess what? You've got to set them in your lap. You have to use your legs and help their little hands. You're going to have to be the one who actually drives the car. I don't, I don't, we used to do this long ago, but it's not supposed to be done anymore. But what I'm trying to make you understand is there are things that people cannot do. And if you're going to require them to do it, you have to enable them to do it. And so it is with God. There are things he requires us to do that we can't do. There are valleys you cannot walk through by your human wisdom and understanding. There are trials you're going to go through in life, and there are going to be people that you meet that are unlovable and unforgivable. And as children of God, we have to supernaturally allow God to do in us what he is requiring us to do. You cannot do it. And the first step is to say, Lord, I know I have to forgive because you told me I have to. But you and I both know that I can't. So if you're going to require me to do that because I don't want to live in sin, the sin of unforgiveness, then I am relying upon your grace to change my attitude, my heart, and my desires so that I will line up with the will of God. God will supernaturally, because of the grace that he purchased on the cross, give you the ability to forgive the unforgivable. And, you know, the Bible says we're supposed to live at peace with all men. It says as much as lies in you. In other words, as far as you're concerned, there can be no, no relationship of strife. There may be people that are, have something against you you can't get along with because they won't let it go. But as much as lies in you, you're to let it go yourself. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Forgiveness does not always mean acceptance. Sometimes you forgive somebody, doesn't mean you're going to let them back in your life. Doesn't mean you're going to trust them again. You know, if you borrow $100 from me, from me, I give it to you and you don't ever pay me back. 
I gotta forgive you of that hundred dollars, but I don't have to loan you another one. Got it? And there's nothing wrong with that. All right? But we have to forgive. We can't hold it because it will destroy us. Now, the uh, this charge is what the Lord has given to us. He says, love one another. Love one another. How many times does the Bible say that? Over and over and over again. And so many times the place that's the meanest is among Christians, not here. You're wonderful. But many places I've been in my life, the meanest people in the world call themselves Christians. Brethren, it ought not to be so. There should be a spirit of love and forgiveness in every group of people that call themselves Christians. Doesn't mean we're perfect. If you require people to be perfect before you forgive them, you will never forgive anybody. Because we're all flawed. So therefore, we are to consider it and we are to live in peace no matter what occurs. And we're supposed to let things go as the grace of God works in us to do it. Sometimes it takes a little while. You don't just get down and pray one time, oh God, I want to forgive that person. Please enable me by your grace to do it because I can't do it myself. And then quite often you get up and it takes, you still got that you're dealing with. It. This is how I know if I forgive them. If I see somebody that I have that has hurt me severely, somewhere, if, that, if I can reach out to them and there's no bitterness in my heart toward them, I know I've forgiven. But if I try to escape from them and run around another aisle, <laughs> try to not meet them face to face, then I know there's still something in my heart that's not right. So we have to let God deal with that. I'm not your judge, you're not my judge. God's the judge, but we have got to let God deal with our relationships with other people. So, here are the reasons that we should not ever fall out with each other. First of all, it's because we are brethren and we have one Father. We're in unity, we have one Father. And God doesn't love one kid more than another. You can't work God against this, you know, sometimes people can uh, work parents. Oh, that's the special kid in the family, so he gets to work the parent to get more privileges. Come on. But God's not that way. You can't do that to God. Everybody, you don't love all that much. God loves them just as much as he loves you. We have one father. If somebody is a child of God, your father is their father. And he's their father just as much as he's your father. We need to understand that. So we are brethren. We have one father. Therefore, we cannot hold things against especially people of the body of Christ. Another thing is that we are his brethren, and we shame our relationship to him who is our peace when we fall out with each other. We bring shame to him. He is our peace. The Bible says he is the prince of peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He came to bring peace to the world. Remember on the day he was born, the angels sang, peace on earth, goodwill to me. And that's why he came. It's his desire that all people live in peace. But those who don't know Christ don't have a clue about living with pe in peace. But as children of God, the Prince of Peace lives within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are to be children of peace. Not striving after things that bring discord and disruption. We're to follow. The scripture says, uh, pastors quote this many times, we're to follow after things that make for peace. We're to diligently work to keep peace, never to bring discord. That's not, that's not, God hates that. He hates for people to stir up discord. So that means sometimes I don't get my way. And sometimes you don't get your way. Because everybody in the room can't get their way all the time. <laughs> That's even true in a marriage, you know. Somebody has to get their way sometimes. One person gets their way all the time, that marriage is probably bound for the divorce courts. You have to give in. You have to give. There's giving and there's taking in a spirit of unity together. And we are all guilty. We're all guilty. 
And instead of quarreling with one another, we need to look in the mirror and we might have occasion to fall out with us. You, know? you look in the mirror, you might have a reason to fall out with that old guy in the mirror sometimes, right? Because sometimes that guy in the mirror is my worst enemy. So we must understand that all of us, are, we have guilt in our own life and, and things that aren't right. We are forgiven by God, whom we have all offended. And therefore, we should be ready to forgive one another. Thank God, I can say openly, for forgiving me. Forgiveness is never anything you deserve. You get it free, freely given. And you know the scripture says in one place, freely you have received, freely give. How important that is. And we're all, by the way, strangers and pilgrims, wandering through this Egypt on the way to Canaan. We're all in that position. And on this journey through Egypt, we are required to present this blessed hope and this relationship of peace to the world that's also going through Egypt, but they're on their way to a much wrong and horrible end. And I tell you that I have been in churches before that, honest to goodness, if a sinner came in, they'd be happier at the bar. Come on. I've been in a church when I was a very young person, just a kid, where one group sat on one side, and it was like this family sat on this side, and this family sat on this side, that never the twain shall meet. Come on. I remember it very clearly. I'm not going to tell you where it was. But when my dad pastored, there was two families, two groups in the church, and they all sat on each side of the church, and they would not have anything to do with each other. Needless to say, the Holy Spirit didn't move much in that church. Come on. I went to a church one time where one family hated the work of the Holy Spirit. If anybody spoke in tongues, the whole family got up left in an assembly of God church. So I'm telling you, the church is supposed to be the lighthouse so that it can be a hospital for people who are on their way to death, who are in walking in death. It's supposed to be a place where the doors open and swing wide and that everybody who walks in the doors knows that it's a place not only where they can be loved, but a place where everybody loves each other. That's the cry of the heart of God. I believe that everybody who walked up to Jesus walked up to him and knew they were loved. If the prostitute that they were ready to stone, I believe she knew she had walked into the presence of a man who loved her for the first time in her life. Are you listening? God help us to know, and, and I'm, I, I thank God for you. You're wonderful. But the enemy is the enemy of us as a congregation as well as us individually. And if he can get into somebody's heart and bring strife so that they affect someone else, he's very happy. He's happier when he can destroy Christians than when he can mess up sinners. He's already got them. So we must strive to keep the unity of the faith. And that can only be done by forgiveness. You see these people sitting around here tonight around this congregation? Somebody's going to do or say something or look at you cross-eyed or something and give you an opportunity to become offended. We're human. We're not perfect. Sometimes you're going to think somebody's rude and walk by and didn't speak to you. Sometimes you're going to think the pastor's being rude because, you know, like I told you, one, I think I told you about one lady in the church many years ago. This is right after we first came to Natchitoches. She was mad because all the new people got more attention than she did in church. And, you know, finding a reason to get mad about something. And thank God I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir a little bit, but I want you to know I'm, you're not the only ones listening. Other people are listening too. And it's crucially important to be warned before we ever walk down that road to ever go to that place. It doesn't, I want to tell you, the kingdom of God is more important than me. And the kingdom of God is more important than you. And if I've got to sit down and shut up so that somebody can feel welcome and warm and loved in the body of Christ, then that's exactly what I need to do. But by the grace of God, he can heal us so much that we welcome people who even have offended us. It should be, and I believe it is in this church, 
that people who have left mad can come back in and be welcomed and loved into the body of Christ. And it is that kind of church. And we should guard it Amen. with our lives. Amen. It's so important. I can't make it important enough. Now, the scripture is strong on forgiveness. And I want to read you the passage that God gave me when I was living in unforgiveness. And if you don't understand the provision of the cross and the grace that Jesus died to give you there, I think there's a very good chance you're living in unforgiveness because you're trying to do it by your own willpower, just like I was. You knew you had to forgive. You knew you have to forgive. But when you're trying to do it by your own willpower and you know you're not doing it, you meet that person, you still got bitterness in your heart, then you get frustrated because you can't do it. And all the time there is a provision to enable you to forgive so that God can do the work in you and then you're free. You know, understanding the grace Jesus provided at the cross is freedom. You understand? Understanding the grace that Jesus provided at the cross becomes the greatest freedom of your life. It's, it's, you can call yourself free, but until you're free in your heart, you're not free. And so the scripture says, if you'll turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Matthew chapter 18. I know I'm not reading out of chapter, 40, uh, chapter 45, but I felt so impressed to deal with unforgiveness tonight and to use this with Joseph. His brothers had harmed him tremendously, but he welcomed them with open arms. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse number 21. The scripture says, Then came Peter to them and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? I'm sure that Peter thought he was being very generous. And Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And if you do some research on that, you'll find out Jesus is just saying infinitely. Because you always forgive. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. For as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. Now this ten thousand, um, whatever he said there, this was like a million dollars. This was an unbelievable debt that he owed, okay? And it says, uh, and the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. He's really telling something that isn't true because there will never be the possibility of him getting this kind of a debt paid off. But he's crying out for mercy. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant, the one that just got through begging for mercy and grace, the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence, ten dollars, I'll just say, and laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Now that is a very good possibility he could have. I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord looked, looked then his Lord, I've lost myself, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, that means he was mad, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise, remember those two words, so likewise, that means just like this illustration. So likewise, shall my heavenly father, this is Jesus talking, 
My heavenly Father, do also unto thee, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Jesus is saying, if you don't forgive, God the Father is going to turn you over to the tormentors. I have been there. I don't know if any of you have ever been there or not. I have been there. I have been there for months and months. The tormenting spirit from God is what sent me to my prayer closet on my knees when God revealed to me the message of Christ. Driving, lived everywhere I went, my mind was tormented. I was paranoid. I was I was afraid, I was, I thought the worst was going to happen. I can't tell you the torment of my mind. I would wake in the middle of the night feeling like the whole world was blowing up around me. That every horrible thing in the world that I could imagine was about to happen. I can't even, there are no words to explain to you what tormenting spirits can do to your heart and to your mind. It drove me to a place I cannot even begin to tell you. While all this was going on, I was still serving as pastor and leading praise and worship sometimes, uh, doing whatever, teaching Sunday school. I was still doing all the things I had ever done, but every moment of my life when I wasn't busy talking or doing something, I lived in a spirit of torment, torment. This went on until about 1992. There was a block of time in my life that I cannot tell you. What I'm telling you this for is to let you know unforgiveness will drive you crazy. And if you don't let God deal with it. See, I didn't know that was my problem. I didn't know it was unforgiveness. Because I still found fault with the same people I found taught fault with before. Technically, most of you know my testimony. So I'm not going to go into all of it. But I was still fine and fault. I still felt righteous in my own mind, like I was more righteous than the ones I wasn't forgiving. Because it's a deception of the enemy. But I don't know how to put it in more accurate words. But I want to tell you something. This scripture is the gospel truth. It will drive you. The tormenting spirits will come. And they will drive you crazy. So I lived like that for months and months and months and months. Part of it even during the time that I had the trigeminal on the route and all the pain and everything else in my life. Only the grace of God, I survived. Only by the grace of God and his forgiveness for me did I survive. And so, thank God, he took me to the prayer closet, which was my, was my, uh, what do you call it, the whipping shed. <laughs> because I had a beautiful prayer closet. I went there, and one morning, the revelation of what I was going through was made clear to me, and my understanding that my problem was me. I was the one who had an issue with God. I was the one, not the people that I was finding fault with, not those that I was not forgiving. That wasn't who had a problem with God. The person who had the problem of God with God was me. And I had to confess before God how utterly awful I was in my spirit. And I never argued with him. I said, you're right. But I don't know how to be set free. But that morning, in my prayer closet, God made me understand, gave me what you need to have is a revelation of grace. It doesn't just happen because you study it. It happens because God bursts it in your spirit. And he told me that I could not get past, uh, most of you know it was my husband primarily that I was finding fault with. And if there's anybody in your life that's the closest to you, that's one you're going to find most fault with. When because he deserved it, it's because I was wrong. Doesn't matter if he's wrong or not, by the way. Doesn't matter about that. 
And so before God showed me, David Allen stood between me and the sky. I couldn't get through to God because there was a block and he was the block because I put him there because of my unforgiveness. And so therefore, God took me to the floor that day and, and broke my heart and gave me the revelation of grace and showed me that no, I could not in myself do anything right. But by his grace, he would set me free and also begin the work of forgiveness that was supernaturally done in my heart. And a, a work began done in me. You know, when I went to talk to my husband, it took him a while to really understand that I was changed, but he finally did. And many of you know that if you knew me back then, you know me now, you know it was a, it was a transformational work that was done in my life that set me free. And I can tell you, saints, today, that I do not really have a serious problem with unforgiveness. Oh, do I sometimes get a little something that aggravates me? Yes, but I don't hold on to it anymore. I don't hold on to it anymore. It happens and just a little bit over, it's over. Because God did a supernatural work of forgiveness in my heart and I can truly say I don't hold grudges and I don't build up things. It just doesn't happen. It's a supernatural, it's not because I'm good, it's because he's good. And it's a supernatural work of God. The old Frances is still right here, and she's still the same. You know, I have to constantly keep her bumped on the head and knocked out all the time because she would rise up and be the same old mean person she used to be. But by the grace of God, unforgiveness is not a part of my life. I want to read that again. Not that I never understand. I'm not perfect. But I do know that unforgiveness is like a poison. I'm not going to go over there and drink the cup on purpose. It will destroy you. You better deal with it. You better let God deal with it because you can. Let me read that again. And so likewise, shall your heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your heart forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. You know, Joseph forgave those brothers. You know, I can't imagine anybody that had more to forgive. Somebody who wanted to kill you, somebody who wanted to throw you in, a, in a, a hole, somebody who wanted to sell you for slavery. That takes a major forgiveness. But you know what he told them in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19, 20, and 21? The Bible says, Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for, I, for, I, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as this as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. You know what Jesus said on the day they nailed his, his hands to the cross and speak to the cross? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Nobody's ever done that to me, folks. Nobody's ever nailed my hands to a piece of wood. Nobody's ever nailed my feet to a cross. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know, Romans 12. I'm again reading verse number 14. If you're looking at the scriptures, Romans 12. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Dear beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. I don't know how many times God's told me, Francis, do you want to get even with them, or do you want me to take care of it? Uh, okay, I opt out. I'll let God take care of it. Whatever he needs to do. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome. It says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And then the scripture says in Ephesians 4 and 32. I know y'all can't get through these this quickly, but Ephesians 4 and 32. And be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That goes back to the parable Jesus told them. The man that had the debt he couldn't pay. All of us had a debt we couldn't pay. We'd all go to hell. All of us run away to hell. 
We didn't deserve to be rescued, but Jesus went to the cross and rescued us, and by our faith reaching out to him, he supernaturally translated us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, regardless of the fact that we didn't deserve it. So the same way you have been forgiven and saved from the powers of hell, that's the same measure with which we are to forgive. That's what the scripture says. First Peter, my last, well, not my exact, almost my last. First Peter 3 and 8 says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. Knowing that ye are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, anybody loves life and want to see good days? Let him refrain, refrain his tongue from evil and his lips if they speak no guile. The word guile means deception or deceit. Let him askew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. The last verse I want to share with you is the, is the verse of grace. Because you cannot do what I just taught you tonight, you have to depend on the provision. You see, your faith is either going to be in Christ and what he did, or in yourself and what you can do. That's the only two places you can place faith. Can I say that again? You're either going to have your faith placed in Christ and what he has already done, or you're going to place your faith in yourself and what you're going to do. I hope you all understand that. It's a powerful statement. I've had my faith placed in myself and what I'm going to do and failed every day of my life. I've also learned to place my faith in Christ and what he has done and lived in peace and freedom every day of my life. I can tell you the best way. Choose life. This scripture is in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. It says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That means the same way you get saved is the same way you get free. By faith, you accept Christ as your Savior and Lord. You don't deserve it. You can't do it yourself. The only thing it requires to be saved is faith. The only thing it requires to be changed is faith. Your part is faith. And God's part is grace. So as I have received the same way I got saved, by believing and receiving provision from Christ, I get up and walk the same way. There's not a new way. You don't get up and say, now let me get to work being a good Christian. Then you immediately are defeated on every side. But if you get up and say, Lord, by your grace, help me to walk the way you want me to walk. And I'm going to tell you that if you will do that, God will start a new work in you that will excite the pure souls off your feet and will make you so excited you'll be dancing and shouting because you've been set free by the blood of the Lamb. And when you're free, you are free indeed. Amen? Well, we're going to close right there, and I'm going to lead us in prayers. We do every Wednesday night. Those audience that's watching, we pray for the nation uh, because we definitely need it. So if you'll join with us right there where you may be and just join with us as we lift up this nation before God and pray for God to intervene and have his own way. You can leave it on. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. We have the privilege of being here. Lord, that you have put us in this kingdom for such a time as this. You knew we were going to be born at this time. Dear Lord Jesus, we cry out to you today that thy kingdom come into this nation and thy will be done. God, I pray over the church of the living God around this nation. Father, I'm asking you that saints of God will stand up, whether they work in the White House or in Congress, or if they work in Washington, D.C., or if they work in the backwoods of wherever they may live. Father, I cry out to you that the believers in Jesus Christ will stand strong with their backbone straight and stand up for righteousness and godliness. Lord, it's not about Republican and Democrat. It's about the righteousness of God and the rightness of the kingdom of God and the word of God. So, Lord, we pray for believers, for churches, for pastors, for ministries. Oh, God, that there will come a breath of the power of the Holy Spirit into every congregation and they will rise up in boldness at this time. Lord, 
we need a revival in the church, Lord, not in the world. They can't be revived. They're dead. Lord, they just need to be saved and born. But the church needs a mighty, soul-shaking revival, a cleansing revival across this nation, in every pulpit and in every, every choir and music ministry and everywhere, God, that your name will be truly lifted up, that man's name will not be exalted any longer, that we will be not be followers of men nor praisers of men, but that we will truly and completely and exclusively exalt Jesus Christ above this nation, who is the answer to the sorrows of this world, God. Lord, I come against the evil that's set against this nation no matter where it is, in any city around this nation. Father, we come against those who come to steal, kill, and destroy because we know what team they're on when they come with that kind of agenda. Only the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And those who come to steal, kill, and destroy are in his camp and doing his work. So, Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus Christ against them. And we pray for deliverance and revival in the midst of it all. Lord, that out in those streets of those cities, there will rise up anointed people singing praises to God, giving glory to God in the midst of the circumstances, Lord, that are out there. Father, I pray for those in government. I pray for those in the House, in the, in the Senate. I pray for the White House, Lord, and for the judicial part of our, our government. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you will bring revival into every single one of those areas. Lord, I pray over the elections. I pray over the election in the city of Natchitoches. Father, that people will vote for the one you want in, in office in all cases. Lord, not based on uh, petty ideas of people, but we get to know your will before we go into the booth to vote. Father, I pray that you will minister, Lord, in our national elections. Bring about your work and your will. God, we want to commit this to you. We want your will. Help us not to be selfish and, and moved by past knowledge or past understanding, but to move into the realm of the Holy Spirit and, and give us direction, each one of us as children of God, to be right and honest and stand for those who will stand for the kingdom of God and for the cause of the church in this nation, Father, we pray. We come against abortion. Lord, we come against the horrible sin of abortion in this nation. We cry out to you for forgiveness and for, for understanding in the hearts of these that are involved in that. To the powers be broken. I come against inequality, Lord, where one people are charged with a crime and another is not. Father, that should be. I pray, oh God, in Jesus' name, of freedom in our law enforcement. Lord, a truth that goes back to righteous judgments, Lord, to come to where it needs to be, oh God. We do cry out to you and pray for all of our, all of our law enforcement, God. Those that are trying their best to do what's right, I pray you'll give them wisdom and guidance and direction and a love for God in their spirit, Lord. There's so many areas of our nation that needs prayer. Help us as a church to get on our knees as we never have before and call out to you in these circumstances we're facing today, oh God. I come against this terrible virus. Lord, I pray you will let this be broken over our nation, let our nation start healing. Lord, bring health and healing and deliverance through this thing. I pray over our schools that we will have protection, that you will minister to our children as they come back, as they come back to church, as they come back to school. Lord, minister to our children and let healing come. Touch, I pray, in the lives of those who are involved with them, that they will lead them in the right path. Father, I ask you today, we put our lives in your hands. We want your kingdom to come. We want your will to be done. Help us not to be ignorant, nor to be deceived. But help us to be wise, wise. Lord, that we may be used of God in this hour before it is too late. And Lord, we are crying out to you, even so come, Lord Jesus. Lord, how we long to see you face to face. How we long to enter into the great, wonderful place you prepared for us, oh God. And Lord, I pray that our hearts will always be looking to the sky. Help us to focus on Jesus, not upon what's going on around us. We need to be aware of what's going on around us, but help us not to let those things get us down, but to lift it up earnestly in prayer, turn it over to you, and get the peace of God reigning in our heart, we pray. I pray for the city of Natchitoches, that you will let the Spirit of God reign over this city. Lord, bring together true believers in unity of prayer, to lift up the needs that are so crucially important in this time. Oh, Lord, we confess deeply and sincerely that we desperately need you, oh God. We desperately need you at this time. Come, Holy Spirit. Breathe upon us, oh God. 
Give us wisdom way above our own ability. Bring in the lost before it's too late, Father. We cry out to you this evening. Bring in our lost children, our lost loved ones, Jesus, to the altar of repentance and recovery before it's too late. Father, we cry this out to you tonight in Jesus' name. We lift this prayer up before you, O oh God, knowing that you hear us when we pray. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.